get started here. Um, welcome everyone to this notice of funding opportunity for apprenticeship. Um, this is a repeated session of the bidders conference that was held last week. Um, and this will be repeated information. Um, this session is being recorded and will be up on Illinois WorkNet on the notice of funding website. Um, and the slide deck will be along with it just for your later viewing. And just, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. First and foremost, um, my name is Kirsten Bayer with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University. And if you have um, any questions or concerns or technical difficulties throughout the session, please feel free to reach out to me via the chat. Um, and also, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we ask that you please hold those until the end of the presentation, and we will address those um, via the live Q&A at the end of the session, as well as um, via the FAQ that will be up on the Notice of Funding website. Um, we also ask that if you please can refrain from unmuting yourselves and keep yourselves muted throughout the presentation, then again, we will address any questions or concerns you have. Um, you can feel free to post those in the chat and then we'll address them at the end of the session. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to our presenters for today. Um, the first one being Kim Kuchenbrock. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? I'd like to welcome everyone um, to our third presentation of the Notice of Funding Opportunity. Uh, during this presentation, we will be providing an overview of the grant submission and the pre-award requirements. Today's presenters, um, besides myself, um, I am Kim Kukumbrod, the Acting Work-Based Learning Administrator and uh, Talent Pipeline Coordinator for the State of Illinois working under contract with um, Illinois State University. The other presenters will be Candace Dickerson from Northern Illinois University and Patrick Campbell, uh, Program Director of uh, DCEO's Office of Employment and Training. Next slide. We also um, have uh, two other presenters, Mark Burgess from the Performance uh, Measures Manager at the um, OET with DCEO and Natasha Telger, who is the Associate Director of Center for Workforce Development at SIU Carbondale. Thank you all to the presenters who are joining us today. Next slide. Um, we ask that all of you bookmark this page um, on this page, we will be adding uh, the NOFO information, any updates uh, regarding the NOFO, the FAQs, the TA sessions will also be recorded there. Also any resources such as um, appendixes to, appendices to the NOFO itself. We'll also have information regarding um, the budget and re, uh, reporting requirements. Next slide. Patrick. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate, um, we cannot answer any questions directly and you do need to post um, all questions on the FAQ um, site on Illinois WorkNet, the, uh, the Notice of Funding Opportunity page. Um, so um, let's start off the uh, presentation with, um, you know, how this aligns with the state plan and the and uh, Governor Pritzker's executive order number three. Go the governor's executive order number three action agenda is to unite workforce development partners around regional cluster strategies, identify high impact regional clusters and associated in demand occupations, implement a coordinated workforce development strategy around regional clusters, prepare Illinois workers for a career, not just their next job, increase apprenticeship opportunities, address barriers to successful training and employment, establish and support uh, equity goals and align uh, with Perkins equity goals, connect job seekers with employers, shorten time from credential to employment and integrate workforce services across program providers for one-stop customers. 
I would also like to um, interject that this NOFO is aligning with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce foundation talent pipeline uh, strategies. So as we go through this, grantees will be required to participate and integrate the program activities outlined um, with the TPM strategies. Um, there will be uh, some training involved with this for our, for our uh, grantees to go through the TPM process and that will be provided to you um, online. And there will be a TPM Illinois Academy um, uh, in the near future. Um, the apprenticeship navigators um, will be the key par parties involved in the TPM strategies as they work through the business partners, and they will be uh, expected to directly support the creation of the industry sector partnerships as part of the Apprenticeship Illinois program. Next slide. Um, this slide here is a way to address um, what the roles were going to be, the specific roles for both the navigators um, in the intermediaries. And uh, collectively, uh, these two roles create the apprenticeship program uh, framework for Apprenticeship Illinois. The navigators roles will be um, to serve as a contact within each region uh, for apprenticeship expansion. They will be responsible for facilitating development of apprenticeships within the uh, specific business and industries. Um, they'll act as a convener uh, for regional coordination and systems networking. And then they will support existing and potential intermediary areas in, in that region. Navigators, um, it is our goal to place a navigator in each 10 regions and um, if for some reason there isn't a navigator in that region, the navigators um, will be uh, reaching beyond each region to help out as needed, as, as well as intermediaries where appropriate. The intermediaries are going to be responsible for coordinating with the navigators and designing a registered apprenticeship training programs. They'll be involved in recruiting the apprentices and why preparing them for the actual apprenticeship training programs. They will implement and manage the partnerships with the apprenticeships and or programs. They'll provide program supports and coordinate any of the training. Um, this NOFO will support both navigator and intermediary efforts that align and leverage existing apprenticeships and creating new registered apprenticeships uh, through Illinois, uh, throughout Illinois. Next slide, please. So there are five core components of the registered apprenticeship. It's the related instruction, on-the-job training, reward for skill gains, uh, the national credential, and then business involvement. So related technical instruction, or RTI, is going to complement the on-the-job learning. The RTI is the classroom-based learning that helps provide the technical knowledge. Uh, the education partners collaborate with businesses to develop the curriculum based on the skills and knowledge that's gonna be needed by the apprentices. All the partners work together to identify how to pay for the related instruction, including a cost to the employer and other funds that can be leveraged. The apprentices also receive on-the-job training or hands-on experience. And this is where the apprentices perform duties at the employer job site. So he will be trained by an experienced mentor or trainer on site. And the on-the-job training is developed by mapping the skills and knowledge that the apprentice must learn over the course of the program in order to be fully proficient at his job. Apprentices also receive uh, rewards for skill gains or also called progressive increases in wages as their skills increase. And this tends to help reward and motivate the apprentices as they advance through their training. Every um, registered apprenticeship program will result in a nationally recognized credential, credential being a portable stackable certificate of completion from an approved RAP program or registered apprenticeship program recognized across the United States. As you build the program, just keep in mind that apprentices program, apprenticeship programs are designed to ensure that apprentices master every skill and have all the knowledge that they need to be proficient for a specific occupation. Please note again that the industry recognized apprenticeship programs or the IRACs have been revoked under the Biden administration and will no longer be considered for this NOFO. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, apprenticeships must have business involvement. 
Um, obtaining employers is usually the biggest challenge for grantees, but they are important because they are the foundation of every apprenticeship program and the skills needed by their workforce uh, are at the core of the apprenticeship program. Businesses must play an active role in building a program and be involved in every step in designing the apprenticeship. Next slide. Okay, so we talked about the five core components of registered apprenticeship. Now I'll address the three approaches to the training delivery. The slide I know can be a little confusing. So today I'll just give an overview and we'll go into more detail during the TA session for intermediaries if needed. As a former intermediary grantee, I know that we generally follow the traditional front load model. So there are three approaches to how one can complete the apprenticeship program. The programs can be time-based, competency-based, or a hybrid. A competency-based approach involves one, I'm sorry, involves only a successful demonstration, not a set time limit, so no set amount of hours. A traditional time-based approach involves completion of at least 2,000 hours of on the learning experience. And for some occupations, it can be a little bit more. And then a hybrid approach requires the apprentice to complete both a minimum number of on-the-job training and RTI hours. And the apprentice must demonstrate their knowledge of skills. So the next part of the slide is gonna show how the classes can be delivered. And it's definitely flexible just to help meet the needs of an employer. So as mentioned before, apprenticeship training is a combination of on-the-job training, the work experience, and technical training. And there are three approaches to how you actually deliver the training to the apprentice. The first one is the traditional model where the apprentice receives both the related instruction and the on-the-job training concurrently throughout the program. So they're doing both. Front-loaded is apprentices complete some of the related instruction before starting a job. And that helps them order to be better prepared to learn the critical skills required for the first day of work on the job site. And then you have segmented where the apprentices alternate between the related instruction and the on the job training. Next slide. Apprenticeships support both the businesses and the individual needs. For the businesses using the, uh, the TPM strategies and in developing employer-led collaboratives, we can identify like competencies for the high demand, hard to fill positions, which then can lead to apprenticeships or pre-apprenticeship opportunities as one of several pathways into a particular career field. So we also want to be able to identify any upskilling needs or advancing uh, current employees to that next level uh, through a, additional apprenticeship opportunities. For the individuals, and this also includes students um, working working with programs of study in combination with pre-apprenticeships, this can lead to a paid apprenticeship training program into a su sustainable career pathway. And this will also include the potential for additional work-based learning and education support as responsible levels increases uh, for that individual. Most of this information is available to you either on NOFO page 29 or in reference in Appendix D. Next slide. The Apprenticeship Illinois expansion is governed um, by the Illinois Workforce and Innovative Board and the Apprenticeship Committees, Work Groups and Task Force, why DCEO is responsible for the administration of the Apprenticeship Illinois. The regional navigators and the intermediaries represent two important sides of the statewide apprenticeship system. The navigators are representing the demand side uh, with the businesses who want to host the apprenticeships and the intermediaries represent the supply side, which is the institutions and or partnerships that coordinate uh, to implement the apprenticeship training programs. And this can include recruiting potential apprentices and preparing them for the programs. Collectively, then both businesses and the individuals benefit from Apprenticeship Illinois as well as any of the supporting stakeholders as demonstrated in this uh, slide. Next slide. Patrick. Sorry, I had it on mute. Uh, so 
The department uh, recognizes that apprenticeships are a promising work-based learning strategy, connecting individuals to a career pathway, as well as being a solution for businesses to find and tap into undiscovered talent. The department and the Illinois Workforce Investment Board, uh, Innovation Board, I'm sorry, Apprenticeship Committee have determined support for apprenticeship intermediaries and regional navigators are the best investment to build the foundation for apprenticeship expansion in Illinois. Regional apprenticeships, uh, apprenticeship navigators and apprenticeship intermediaries represent two important sides of a state apprenticeship system. Navigators represent the demand side, businesses who wanna host apprenticeships and intermediaries represent the supply side, the institutions and or partnerships that coordinate and or implement apprenticeship programs, including recruiting potential apprentices and preparing them to enter apprenticeships, the boots on the ground. The state received um, its um, uh, our uh, apprenticeship expansion grant from the U.S. Department of Labor um, this June, um, and we then um, strategized and, and put together a notice of funding opportunity, partnering with sister agencies and other organizations that um, wanted to contribute to um, how this uh, notice of funding opportunity uh, was uh, issued and um, the deliverables within it. Um, but remember that the purpose of this notice of funding opportunity is to increase the number of registered apprentices by 750 before June of uh, 20. 25, I believe. Is that correct, Kim? Or 20, 2024, I apologize. 2024, yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, other goals include increasing number of apprentices from historically underrepresented populations and growing apprenticeships as a career pathway strategy in more places in Illinois. Um, so we are looking heavily at the uh, targeted populations um, that are, have been historically underserved, such as um, the disabled population um, and uh, uh, under, they're, they're all listed in the notice of funding opportunity, underrepresented uh, populations. Uh, Patrick, I could jump in and say we are ta uh, we're talking about re-entry, um, individuals re-entering the workforce, those with disability, abilities, uh, military, um, aging, youth, and certain sectors that have been significantly impacted um, by COVID-19. So next slide, please. So there, um, there are two program approaches uh, under this particular NOFO. The first approach is to fund regional apprenticeship navigators. And the second approach is to develop new and expand established apprenticeship um, intermediaries. Um, these pro two approaches were uh, refined based on the feedback that we've received from the apprenticeship committee and any of the current grantees. So, Talking about strategy one, the goal is to establish a regional navigator in all 10 EDR regions. And right now we have uh, a few regions that do not have navigators and those are EDRs two, three, and seven. Um, those actually are the Southeastern, North Central and East Central regions. We are going to uh, pay uh, very close to these regions so we can establish a navigators um, in that region under this NOFO, but we also want to be able to um, make sure that we have navigators in areas that are already established. It's very important to note that current grantees should not assume that they are guaranteed refunding for their existing uh, programs. So um, all 10 regions are open um, for uh, a navigator um, role in this particular NOFO. So um, the second stage of it is to develop new or expand established apprenticeship um, intermediaries. And um, so the intermediaries can be 
quite a few different individuals. They could be uh, a, a community-based organization. It could be an ELWIA. It can be a, an education institute. Um, so there's a lot of different um, components that are different resources that an intermediary um, can either use or establish uh, through this NOFO. So um, I want to point out that um, under this technical section of the apprenticeship uh, uh, NOFO, there are specific sessions addressing those targeted populations that uh, Patrick and I just mentioned. And we want to, we are presenting these in TA sessions to show how that these uh, underrepresented populations can fit into the Illinois framework. All of these sessions are being recorded. And so you may go back uh, to the NOFO page to view them um, at your leisure. Um, they will continue through uh, the first week of August in scheduling. One area that we are also addressing is DEI and how um, that is plays into this particular apprenticeship NOFO. Again, always go back and reference the NOFO uh, website for all the latest information. Next slide. So again, let's go back and talk about the approach with num uh, approach number one. There are going to be approximately 10 to 12 grants awarded with a funding range between 75K and 125K. Uh, collectively for under this NOFO, um, there's been 750 to 1.5 million set aside for the navigator approach. So uh, with this, the grant round, the grant round seeks to cultivate apprenticeship development that's going to lead to increased registered apprenticeship enrollment in areas of the state where apprenticeship programs do not exist or are underdeveloped. We plan to promote new strategies for communicating the value of workforce diversity to, to the employers and proactively create equity strategies that lead to historically underrepresented individuals and to increase the number of individuals entering and succeeding in a registered apprenticeship training programs. Um, so I do want to make a special note under the Navigator uh, approach number one that there will be consideration given to supporting more than one Navigator in the greater Chicago metropolitan uh, region just based on population alone. Um, this, this map here shows you where each region is located, as well as each um, ELWIA within those regions. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what is the role of a regional uh, navigator? What is it that they actually do? So first of all, they're going to serve as a key contact. Um, and they're gonna serve as an apprenticeship consultants to businesses, to the education providers. And when we pr uh, refer to education providers, that can be um, high schools, any uh, second uh, secondary training schools such as, or uh, post-secondary such as your community college or universities, but it also includes trades associations. It can include any type of training provider that can be uh, tied into the uh, apprenticeship program. So they'll also be advisors to your local workforce areas. It will be uh, chambers of commerce or any other apprenticeship partners. The navigator will serve as a conven convener uh, to coordinate uh, the sector partnerships, between any of the interested parties and connecting the various apprenticeship components to supportive services. And that will help reduce um, barriers uh, for workers. And they'll also be responsible for collecting and tracking the talent develop development needs for each sector uh, partner. So they will also facilitate development of apprenticeships with businesses and, and, and industries. So what that entails in, is uh, working with the employers and conducting worksite visits to assess the viability of an apprenticeship program, as well as identifying informational and financial resources, including apprenticeship tax credits that employers can take ad advantage of when uh, becoming a sponsor for an apprentice. They will also act as a convener for regional coordination and system networking. And that entails developing an extensive network of stakeholders um, at all levels, including both public and private sector 
um, within a region. And, and then from there, they will identify opportunities for program expansion and promotion, short and long-term demand planning, looking and evaluating competencies and credentials uh, to develop a talent value stream uh, for the employers. Um, again, this would be based on each sector partnership and evaluating the return on the investment uh, with those partners. They will also provide administrative and technical support to the intermediaries and uh, participate in any of the state of Illinois sponsored work groups and training programs. Next slide, please. So continuing from the previous slide, the navigators are responsible for promoting and creating those networks. Um, and it's not limited to just a particular sector business, but it could also include industry associations, uh, community-based organizations, uh, technical schools, or even the school districts. Um, and collectively, the navigator will lead all of these partners through a talent pipeline and management process in order to identify and address those common pain points that an employer deals with. And that is everything from unfilled positions, upskilling and, and retention are some of the most common pain points. So the navigator will be responsible for validating and demonstrating a deliverable to the business partners. So we want to articulate how they will be collecting the data through the TPM process and outreach. And this must be outlined in your application. You know, uh, previously it's been a little uh, difficult to validate the ROI um, and the deliverables to the business partners. Under this particular NOFA, we are looking for more details on how uh, the navigator plans to perform these tasks and how are they gonna track the results um, from these sector partnerships. Next slide, please. Okay, so under attachment three in the NOFO, you'll be able to identify the deliverables and the outcomes uh, for your navigators. The specific project outcomes, the goals and the deliverables must be included in your proposal. The agreed upon deliverables and outcomes will be tracked utilizing a project management tool developed by the, um, by the department and the Illinois WorkNet. Uh, competitive applications will clearly articulate how the activities funded under this NOFO support the goals to create the 750 uh, targeted apprenticeships and as measured by the activities and the outcome. The grant application must include projected um, outcomes that are all provided again in attachment three. Next slide. Candace. I was muted, my apologies. Okay, so as Kim mentioned earlier, um, there are two approaches to the program. The second one is the intermediaries and it's working with developing new and expanding established apprenticeship programs through the intermediaries. Um, the number of grants that will be issued for this round is 16 to 20. They will be funded between 150000 to 350000 each. And it's a total of $1 to $4 million for the intermediary option of the grant. So a inter new intermediary is one that can quickly get an emerging apprenticeship program into operation and is able to immediately recruit and register apprentices. The existing intermediary already has programs that are in place and the organization is like able to easily supplement those programs. So an example would be an existing program who wants to diversify their program with DEI to include women, persons with disabilities, example. Um, this grant also wants to fund um, programs and projects that proactively support equity. So by creating recruiting um, strategies, and outreach and support strategies that result in an increase in the number of diverse populations enrolling in and successfully completing the apprenticeship. So those who are on the targeted populations are given priority in the merit review process for the application. And all of the targeted populations, again, are listed out in the NOFO. So make sure that you review that. 
along with the diversity of the population of the participants. We want you to start thinking about business owners of that diverse group. And also when recruiting, consider the different partners that also service these individuals. So we're really asking for a lot of creativity and thinking about outside of the box and how you do your recruitment practices. Um, next slide. Okay, so an intermediary. What does an intermediary do? Well, the main goal of the intermediary is to ease the burden for the businesses, particularly the small companies that don't have personnel to execute those kind of tasks. They help perform administrative responsibilities like registering the business, registering the apprentices, um, tracking activities, and reporting the results. The intermediary must be the key point of contact and support for any of the navigators in the region. The intermediaries must also coordinate with the regional navigator to facilitate the registration of the new programs with the United States Department of Labor, Office of Apprenticeship, or the expansion of the existing programs. It's very important that the intermediaries fully understand business development and workforce development. And again, the intermediaries are there to help the employer determine their needs, um, coordinate apprenticeship programs, and help them and hire and mentor uh, apprentices. Next slide. Okay, so again, the major goal for the intermediaries is to recruit apprentices and prepare them for apprenticeships. So most of this has been spoken to before on a previous slide, so I won't read it all, but we really just wanna focus on intermediaries must demonstrate their knowledge of DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion within the apprenticeship occupations and the industries. It's also going to be very important for the intermediaries to develop strong partnerships. So for example, partnering with a training provider that's already conducting RTI. Another example would be having a provider who would be able to utilize resources from another organization like sharing curriculum, um, standards and best practices, because having those strong partnerships is definitely going to help build your program. Next slide. Okay, so again, the goal of this uh, grant is to have 750 new apprentices. So we have the new intermediary and the existing intermediary. So someone that's new as an intermediary could be a school district trying to start a high school registered apprenticeship program or an industry association that's looking to get started with apprenticeships. Um, someone that can quickly get into an emerging apprenticeship into operation and is able to immediately recruit and register apprenticeships. An existing intermediary does not necessarily have to be one that's funded currently through one of our grants, but they already have a program in place and the organization is able to easily supplement those programs. Again, somebody that's looking to diversify their program, for example. Either way, in your application, you must state exactly how you're going to hit the state goal or help the state hit its goal of 750 apprentices. If you are a current in intermediary, you must be able to articulate how your program will increase the number of registered apprentices and how you can expand them into other sectors. And if you're a current grantee, make sure that you are able to describe how you met your current grant obligations. Next slide. So the deliverables, um, go ahead and make sure that you read the NOFO. You can refer to page 10, um, Appendix K of the NOFO. But we want to focus again, the number of apprentices, you have to hit your deliverable. And employer outreach is very important. So it's not just contacting an employer, but they need to be engaged. Uh, the Department of Labor defines an engaged employer as one that has adopted apprenticeship programming and is planning to host a registered apprenticeship. And a contacted employee provides outreach to organizations and discuss apprenticeship opportunities with the decision maker. So you need to be very clear on, you know, if you have engaged employers versus just contacted. 
And next slide. Um, I actually don't believe that Natasha was able to join us today. If someone else wants to cover this slide or if we would like to just briefly go through it and move on. Um, I, I think um, we can reference um, the other posted uh, where Natasha was able to reference this. This is very um, general information about the system um, uh, for Illinois WorkNet. So, um, it can certainly be that information was delivered in both of the previous sessions. Good afternoon, this is Mark Burgess, uh, also with the Office of Employment and Training Performance Unit. And uh, in addition to some of the deliverables and outcomes that Candace and Kim and Patrick have already spoke to, uh, there are some performance outcomes that all of our grantees will need to comply with and meet uh, expectations that are very common to the WIOA uh, populations in general and, and our programs. Uh, those require that quarterly reports be submitted. You see here the reporting periods uh, ending March, June, September, and December. And within 30 days of the end of each of those quarters, you'll be required to submit um, these, these reports uh, and provide particular specific data on the participants and on the, um, uh, the, the grants themselves, the programs themselves. Um, each grantee will be expected to meet uh, the local negotiated performance measures. So for all 22 of our local workforce areas, we negotiated uh, rates in the five measures you see on the right. Uh, and, and those will be available if you're awarded a grantee, those, those levels will be available for you to see uh, what the expectation is in your area of the state. Um, as I mentioned, there are five measures that will be recorded. Uh, three of those are exit-based, so when a, a participant uh, is finished with their training, with their program, gets their certificate, and exit our program, they'll start a period of time where we'll track uh, outcomes such as employment, and, and others, and then two measures are tracked based on training. If you'll go to the next slide, please, Kirsten. Thanks. Um, so here are three measures that your report would be required to report on. Uh, their exit outcomes, as I mentioned, meaning uh, we start tracking them once they've uh, left our program, hopefully successfully. Uh, the first two are very similar, but they're tracked at different time periods after that exit. Uh, and they are measurements of how many individuals received uh, or entered unsubsidized employment uh, in either the second or the fourth quarter after they've exited our program. Also, if you are uh, entertaining, uh, training individuals that qualify or are el eligible as Title I youth, uh, they can also meet the uh, requirements or the, the criteria of these two measures by also entering into additional education or training activities. So for those youth, they don't have to necessarily uh, leave the program and go directly into employment uh, to get a positive outcome. They can go on with, with um, further, further um, education and, 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 and training programs. And then the third, third measure on an exit outcome is we measure the uh, wage rate, uh, median earnings rate of each of those individuals against two quarters after they exit. And we track those through um, information provided to us through the Department of Employment Security. The last two measures are what we consider training outcomes. Uh, and for a, a, an apprenticeship program, Kirsten, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the credential attainment rate is very important. Uh, once someone completes a program successfully, that credential that they, uh, that they gain uh, from going through the program is counted towards this credential attainment rate. There are many other credential attainments uh, that someone might get through training, but with this being the apprenticeship uh, 
notice it, it's just easy to, to use that as the best example for what we expect as a positive outcome from these individuals. And then the final measure is what's called measurable skill gains. Individuals are expected to gain information, skills uh, throughout their training program. And in fact, that uh, measure can be tracked on an annual basis or a programmatic basis. So July to June, uh, anyone showing that they've, they've gained skills over that 12 month period of time can be counted in the measure as a positive outcome. If they have a two year, three year training program, each one of those program years, they have the opportunity to show that they've uh, continued to, to um, improve their skills and we can count that towards this measurable skill gain. So it's very important uh, uh, back to the reporting part of this that these are reported on a timely basis so that your uh, outcomes can be counted in the performance measure. And, and, and with apprenticeship programs, um, the negotiated rates are probably low, to be honest with you, because apprenticeships are, are a much uh, higher success rate than our general population. So um, it, it's really just about tracking those appropriately. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll add also, if, if uh, you're awarded a grant, we have anticipation that we'll provide additional information uh, around each of these measures and the actual reporting system and, 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 and the uh, data elements that we need to track. Uh, again, if you're, if you're awarded a grant, we'll be holding another session to get into more detail on the performance expectations. Thank you. Uh, Governor Pritzker, the state uh, Illinois Workforce Investment Board and uh, the state workforce partners um, are committed to increasing the equity um, in our workforce. So the, one of the fundamental goals of this NOFO is to increase apprenticeship opportunities for minorities and the targeted populations that will be presented in our special TA sessions. So those are the underrepresented um, areas. And we want to make sure that we are also reaching out to apprenticeship occupations um, that are in the high demand, hard to fill, but also we are, um, we are not limiting it just to that. We're also looking at apprenticeship programs and opportunities that um, are not considered to be the more popular ones, such as construction uh, trades as uh, apprenticeships are always associated with that, but we're looking at other apprenticeship opportunities that are, are not common uh, or not developed at this point. An example of that might include um, working in an equine management or a cosmetology or financial and banking. These are just a, a couple of them that are, are just coming to mind very quickly, but each proposal should highlight and address how they're going to um, include the talent pipeline management. How are they going to participate in that? What targeted populations they're going to be approaching? What targeted industries, occupations, and growth sectors? So um, with this, that the department will accept projects that are going to support targeted industries included in the state and or the regional workforce plans as appropriate. The applicants must also demonstrate how the project will align with state, regional, and local workforce plans or other resources as part of an analysis uh, with labor market information. A lot of this can be uh, referenced in Appendix F, and we also encourage you to refer to Tables 1 and 3 um, in the NOFO. So the grant requirement should also highlight if you're addressing incumbent workers, new employees, youth and pre-apprenticeship training programs, but a strong focus should also be included in the DEI and how you plan to leverage program uh, funds from other partners. Um, so, you know, don't just rely on um, the grant funding, but how are you gonna look at your other industry partners or your local uh, resources such as your WIOA programs to leverage those funds. Next slide, please. So here, just real quick, are some uh, 
again, some quick rundowns of what we're looking for in the grant requirements for both the navigators and the intermediaries is that the navigators must participate in TPM training, that all must participate in other activities related to apprenticeship system building. This may include some online resources and training that is provided through the Illinois WorkNet system. Uh, we want to encourage expansion in emerging industries and align regional and local workforce plans, as I just mentioned. Uh, we also want to, all of this to count uh, as part of the 750 apprentice expansion participants. And these must be registered apprenticeship programs um, by the end of the grant period. Now, I also want to point out um, uh, or mention that IRAPs are not considered part of this NOFO. The Biden administration uh, retracted IRAPs and so therefore do not include any IRAP apprentices in this particular NOFO. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, as mentioned several times throughout this NOFO, there are target populations that this grant wants to serve. Um, the Apprenticeship Illinois Committee, the governor, the United States Department of Labor, and DCEO are all putting an emphasis on DEI. And the list of target populations, again, is on page 15 of the NOFO. DEI is a priority. Um, projects funded under this NOFO must include strategies to address equity, including the changes in the recruitment practices, intentional and inclusive marketing, including using images of women, persons with disabilities, people of color, um, addressing discrimination within programs and at workplaces, and offering support that boosts retention and completion, such as childcare, uh, transportation, and career counseling. We do know that a lot of the people within the DEI community may need more um, supportive services that can help boost them to be able to actually stay in their apprenticeship program as well as complete it. Um, both the navigator and the intermediary applicants are required to address diversity, equity, and inclusion in this proposal application and articulate why and how um, this can be cost effective and an effective solution for both the employer and the community as a whole. Um, specifically, the proposals and um, reviewers are going to be looking for evidence that the applicants do include a DEI action plan, and that will be for both the navigators and the intermediaries, and this outlined in Appendix B. Next slide. Does that count? Sorry, I apologize. I had myself on mute. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, referencing the three tables that are in your NOFO on targeted industries, occupation, and growth sectors, here's a quick snapshot um, of those particular tables. Now, um, table one recognizes the top growth industries, and we also realized that none of us at that time knew that the pandemic was going to uh, occur. So in your NOFO, you can use, as we mentioned, other uh, labor market information for some of those top growth industries within your particular region. But here is just a quick snapshot of the main uh, growth areas, transportation, finance, healthcare, professional, and construction. And these are all outlined in the state, um, the state plan. Next slide, please. Table two um, outlines industries such as accommodation and food services, retail trade, manufacturing, and others, uh, and a special attention to the arts, entertainment, recreation, and hospitality industries. These are all some of the hardest hit industries in Illinois. Please reference Appendix G for more information regarding the impact of the arts, entertainment, and recreation um, industries. This will take you into a more granular overview of the specific uh, jobs that we are looking at for apprenticeships. Small businesses were also severely impacted by the pandemic. 
um, especially in the rural regions. Um, this impact exasperated what was uh, already occurring in rural e regions such as Southern Illinois, which is still recovering from uh, deindustrialization, um, energy economy shifts away from coal and the loss of companies th that provided employment uh, to the residents um, in this region. So in the NOFO, we ask that you include an, uh, a brief analysis of how your project will be informed by labor, market information, and current and local regional workforce data that identifies the needs not only for the employers, but for the job seekers um, as well. Next slide, please. So again, this is going to look at emerging registered apprenticeship uh, training opportunities. And on the left side, you can see the different industries, um, as well as the occupations that can be impacted or are open for apprenticeship opportunities. Um, if it is says multiple, um, we're not targeting a specific um, job title or a sector partnership, but we're also we're looking at um, many, many opportunities for apprenticeships. For example, um, healthcare, we we're talking about healthcare technician positions there, and that could be anything from rad techs, pharmacy tech, uh, CMAs, CNAs, co uh, medical coders. Um, it, it could also include um, your, your nursing programs as well. Under um, education, um, side of things, when we're talking about multiple, we're just not talking about um, the educators, we're talking about the support services, the paraprofessionals, um, the janitorial, the bus uh, drivers, uh, social workers, teachers aides, they would all fall under that. And as we come out and recover from the pandemic, we're going to even see a larger increase possibly in some of these fields just because there could be an, uh, an exit from this particular career pathway um, into another one and some are just going to start retiring early. So we're going to be watching this very, very carefully. Um, over the next um, few months, and we'll be also be looking at this within your NOFOs. When something is cross-sector, you know, for example, human resources or um, IT help desk or uh, network administrators and so forth, that could also fall under a cross-sector uh, category, category, meaning that those services are offered across all sector partnerships, not to one specific sector. We also are demonstrating whether it's a recovery or a growth um, within those areas and if there's an opportunity for um, a new apprenticeship such as in the arts and entertainment area or if we are expanding in an area such as uh, construction trades. Again, references are on page seven and nine and appendix F of your uh, NOFO. Next slide, please. Patrick? Yes, before we go to this slide, um, Natasha is on now um, from uh, uh, Illinois WorkNet. And if we can, um, I see we're on slide 32. If we could return to slide 22, um, then she will update that. Uh, she'll go through that slide with you. I apologize, Patrick. Um, what slide am I supposed to be on? 22. I apologize. I'm not able to see the the numbers here. Let's go back to the slide for the only work at. I'll let you know when I see it. Oh. We're on 29. There we, there we go. go. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, this slide shows that we do have uh, communication and reporting tools that are available through all my WorkNet. And there are, um, it's used by the intermediaries, navigators, and also with as a communication tool with the individuals 
that are being served as well. So as we work across the image from left to right, you'll see that uh, this set of tools has resources um, for interme intermediaries. Uh, so we have the uh, project serving individuals. We have an intake form that includes eligibility and enrollment. We also have case management tools um, and case note tools uh, that can be used to uh, communicate with the others that are serving those individuals as well as with the individual themselves. And then we also have the other individuals impacted upload uh, tools as well as the IWTS uh, incumbent uh, worker uh, information that can be uploaded into the system. And for navigators, we have uh, business intelligence tools. Again, we have those communication tools and follow-up tools so that you can record um, outreach to the employers. And then we also have uh, some tools for documenting outreach events as well as um, engagement opportunities. Or uh, areas where you've engaged with those uh, organizations. And then we have the work plan and reporting section. So all that information will be able to be in the system. So you can just, um, you know, put in your data into the system and then put in your planned information. Um, we have those tools along with dashboards and reports. And then we'll also have for you the connect to navigators. So we have a map where you can see the other intermediaries, navigators, American job centers uh, to help, you know, with that transparency and sharing um, information as well. And so the information that is included in the system is used for uh, various types of reporting. So whether it's federal reporting or for uh, local reports, um, the information is all available through the system. And now we can go back to the slide we were on, correct? Yes, please. I'm sorry, I, was, I, I said yes, and it's uh, slide 33. I didn't realize I was on mute again. Go back one more. There you go, thank you. Okay, elements for a competitive pro proposal. Um, you know, we're looking and, and you need to ask yourself all, um, all of the questions that are in the um, uh, evaluation components um, in within the notice of funding opportunity. So you need to ask yourself, do we have the capacity to do this? Do we have um, uh, a, a history in doing this? Do we have a connection to the targeted population or industry um, or both? Um, do Have we put together a quality proposal that um, answers all the questions for the elements um, that are listed within the uh, notice of funding opportunity and um, the cost effectiveness. So what are the costs? Have we answered those? Is it within reason? Um, and you need to go through all of those questions and ask yourself, um, did we answer those? And can I point to those within the narrative um, that has been articulated in your application? Um, <clears throat> all grantee or all applicants will need to coordinate with both their local workforce plans and the regional workforce plans. So if you are a local workforce area, you will need to coordinate with other local workforce areas within that economic development region. Um, if you are not, you will need to coordinate with both and ensure that there's um, a clear connection between what those regional plans reflect and what the local plans reflect and what your uh, deliverables are in your application. It is important to note 
that we are not looking for grantees that are solitary grantees. Um, we are looking to develop um, partnerships and to see that there is coordination um, throughout the region um, for this project. Um, now, I, I will say that um, intermediaries, um, that may look different than what navigators are doing. Um, we recommend an MOU um, because we have found that problems in these grants um, usually is a direct result of <clears throat> partnerships that have been developed and those partnership deliverables have not been clearly articulated. They, one partner was under the impression that another partner was going to do something and it doesn't get done and it becomes a problem for that grantee. With businesses, we do realize that MOUs are a little more difficult. Um, we would look for letters of commitment uh, from businesses on their letterhead. Um, that would be, um, you know, acceptable as well. Um, please refer to the resources um, and the materials that are online. Look through those resources um, and utilize the materials that we have provided to you. Um, so. I think uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, I do wanna say that um, we have a, a new system for tracking um, the um, acceptance of these applications. And I would not recommend that you wait until five o'clock or uh, 4.58 to submit your documents. Um, I would get them in as early as possible. There will be people um, that are more familiar with it that will be um, trying to upload their information on there. Um, so there may be a delay due to that. Um, but any, any application that's received at 501 will be disqualified. Um, so it is, um, that's central time. It is very important that you get your application and all supporting documentation in on time and before that five o'clock um, deadline. <clears throat> you need to have all the appropriate information that is listed here. We do look for um, um, what program staff will be dedicated to this. <clears throat> Pardon me, program staff. Um, have been an issue in the past. So applicants have received their grant and then they, it takes them six months to seven months to put on a project lead or um, put on staff to, to work with the grant. So they're behind and um, many times they are not able to meet their deliverables and um, it is not a success um, for that grantee. And we, you know, um, have to take action um, to ensure that those funds are being used properly. Uh, I think I've addressed or we've addressed as a, a team, um, most of the other items that are uh, listed here. I will say one last word about um, your executive summary, um, the opportunity to talk about yourself. Um, for those grantees that um, are currently grantees, do not, assume that we know anything about you. Um, please ensure that you are telling us everything because the reviewers very well could not know um, that you are currently a grantee. You may tell them, um, but what we are looking for, and it is spelled out in the notice of funding, is deliverables from current grantees. So if you put in there that you are currently a grantee, um, but you are unable to make your deliverables, um, you know, th that's, that's not the best thing in the world to, uh, to have on, on your grant application. Um, so you're gonna wanna articulate your success stories, um, both with employers, securing new apprenticeship programs and um, with participants. Um, so we will look for that type of information in there. Next slide. This slide here, I'm not going to uh, go into too much detail with you, except for there is a link here on this slide that you can find your uh, 
your regional plan as well as your local plans. If you're not familiar with this site, um, this has a dashboard where you can go up and pull up information from um, each of the regions as well as local as well. So um, this is just more of an FYI slide. Next slide. So we've talked a lot um, regarding TPM and a sector partnerships, you know, so really what is the sector partnership and what does that all involve? Um, so sector partnerships um, is a group of business leaders from like industries um, who come together to address common pain points that they're dealing with. And again, that could be the unfilled positions. It could be diversifying their workforce, um, dealing with retention and, and pending retirement uh, with it. So they come together um, to work as a team with their education, our workforce development, economic development and community organizations to address these common pain points and to develop a strategic plan to address them. Uh, the importance of the partnerships that is that they are employer led, not education led, not association led, but they are led by the employer. And there are clear benefits for the employers um, when they are collectively working together versus siloing themselves uh, within their region. So the partnership, some of the, again, some of the benefits could be the raising of the branding and image of a particular industry or sector, it's communicating uh, with one voice the needs to your education training providers and how you can leverage that uh, for either changing policies um, within a local, state, or national level, but also does your education provider have the capacity to expand their training, uh, training programs as well as are they willing to adapt their curriculum in order to need, meet the new needs of employers? Uh, so it is a new approach to addressing common pain points and uh, sector partnerships, once they start out, you know, you'll start out small with maybe the navigator leading the group and you're bringing in your partners together and at different stages of that, then that's when you're going to bring in your other tiered uh, partners, which would be your education training providers, uh, your local LWIAs. Um, any support services training providers um, that are available within your community. Next slide, please. Got it. Patrick? Yeah. Um, so we've gone over some of the MOU information, um, but we wanted to remind um, everyone that <clears throat> We are looking for partnerships um, and we are looking for you to develop clear MOUs um, with each of those partners. So there is an understanding of what they will be responsible for. Some of those items, um, you will wanna take a look at this slide and say, who's going to be doing recruitment? This is particularly important for um, intermediaries, uh, but can also apply to um, navigators. Um, for intermediaries, eligibility determination, um, that may be a local workforce area, unless you are a local workforce area, IWDS entry, um, enrollments, case management, performance requirements, reporting, and follow-up. So all of these items may be um, uh, a different partner, or it may be um, uh, maybe two or three partners together, maybe doing multiple um, items that are listed on here. Next slide. As a reminder, if you're going to be submitting a proposal um, for approach number one, the navigator proposal should include the following things, the region's needs for opportunities identified, um, how they will serve as the point of contact, what is their business outreach plan? How are they gonna reach out and, and help with the development of uh, expanding our apprenticeship training programs? Any evidence of existing capacity or experience if they are a current navigator and any evidence that they will be able to increase those apprenticeships within the uh, June 2024 deadline. Next slide, please.
And also the intermediary proposals must have the following things, a solid program design and implementation plan. If you're a new intermediary, you need to know how this intermediary will develop the programs and where they don't exist. We also need to know for leveraged resources, how will these resources help build and expand programming, especially for our underserved populations. We need to have a solid outreach plan for potential apprentices and a solid plan for preparation, including equity and apprenticeship strategies. Um, like a solid outreach plan, essentially your marketing, how you're gonna market to reach these DEI apprentices. And then provide evidence that you will be able to increase the number of apprentices in the region by June 2020. I think that should be four. And next slide. Uh, again, we just want to make sure that you are bookmarking this site because all of the information regarding this NOFO will be found at this uh, at this particular link, um, including the FAQs, which will be updated uh, frequently um, as we move through this process. Next slide, please. Beginning last week, we started with our first uh, bidders conference uh, schedule, and this is wrapping up with our, our third and final um, presentation in regarding the, the bidders conference information, but we will continue with specialized TA sessions through um, the end of July. Those targeted um, webinars will focus on the aging workforce, re-entry, youth, disabled, military personnel, DEI, targeted industries, arts, entertainment, recreation, and accommodation, accommodation industries, TPM strategies, tools for navigators, and intermediary best practices. Again, we encourage you to go to the website for all webinar details and any registration links. Next slide. The deadline to submit your proposal is September 15th, 2021 at 5 p.m. Um, we ask that uh, you do not wait to the last minute um, because the system that we use, it has a time track on it. And if we receive the proposal at 5.01, we cannot accept that. So please do not wait um, to the last minute to submit your, propo and your proposal. And that is 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. The rest of the time period, um, we will be looking at grant negotiations between October and December with the goal of announcing the awardees on January, uh, the 1st of January, 2022. Next slide. Okay, so um, Kim just mentioned that the applications must be received via email no later than five p.m. Central Standard Time on September 15, 2021. The email address is on the screen that you will send them to grant application at illinoisworknet.com. Make sure that it includes the application form, the executive summary, the technical proposal, the resumes of the program staff that you have or intend to have on this uh, application the partnership agreement and or the MOUs and also the budget proposal. That technical proposal is going to be limited to 20 pages and please see the font and the paper side that needs to be used as well. Next slide. So the NOFO questions, the applications are subject to disclosure in response to requests received under provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. Um, questions regarding the grant opportunity can be sent to apprenticeship at illinoisworknet.com. And that page will be monitored um, by myself actually, and we will get those questions sent out or the answers, I'm sorry, sent back to you or posted on the FAQ on the NOFO hold page. Next slide.
The grant proposals will be reviewed on a competitive basis. So each proposal will be scored on a 100% point scale and the department shall consider the following criteria when evaluating the application submittals. Capacity, applicant capacity will receive 20% of the points. Documentation of need and opportunity will receive 30% and that's including uh, geographical considerations. The quality of the project plan will receive 40% of the points and that will also include addressing equity within the apprenticeship training programs. And 10% will be allocated for budget narrative, cost effective, effectiveness and the return on investment and sustainability um, of the program. Next slide. So I want to know if these grants can support new employee apprenticeships. And the answer is yes. An example would be an intermediary that's working with an employer to bring on new employees as apprenticeships. I mean, apprentices, I'm sorry. Um, the direct services include related technical instruction, um, on-job training, supportive services, and case management. They must be... Uh, on the ETPL list as well, if it is a WIOA participant. So Candace, let me jump in there on that yep. one um, in particular. Um, and you are absolutely correct that it needs to be on the ETPL, uh, em employer training uh, provider list. Um, but for apprenticeships, if it's already a registered apprenticeship or if it will be registered apprenticeship um, then um, there is a process for getting those onto the ETPL list the state list for approved training providers uh, of, of the programs um, so you'll want to take a look at that information um, because although it may not be a uh, on the ETPL right now, if your intention is, and you'll need to spell this out, if your intention is to start a new kind of apprenticeship, um, then those training um, would be on the ETPL, um, you know, once it is um, a registered apprenticeship program. Um, so that gets very tricky because in order, if you're going to use um, WIOA funding on this um, through a co-enrollment, um, then you'll need to be very careful about the training unless that training is already on the ETPL list. So um, I hope that is clear as mud, but um, uh, the bottom line is um, um, in order to use WIOA funds, you do have to have it on the ETPL. Go ahead, Candace. So uh, can an applicant submit proposals for both a navigator and an intermediary? Um, yes, this NOFA will support both work-based training and up, whoops, I met the wrong one. Am I reading the correct one? Yes, we can uh, submit, You let me just start all over. Can an applicant submit proposals for both a navigator and an intermediary? Um, applicants can submit proposals under both program approaches. However, the applicants must submit separate proposals and commit to hire distinct staff for each role. Next slide, please. This NOFA will also support work-based training and upskilling outlined in a registered apprenticeship training program. Uh, to ensure that employees of a company can acquire the skills necessary to retain employment or advance within a company. Companies are typically required to pay at least 50% of the incumbent worker training cost. Next slide. Can these grants support pre-apprenticeship programs? Um, it is recognized that having a strong pre-apprenticeship infrastructure is needed to ensure access for those individuals. Um, this NOFA will support the pre-apprenticeship programs that lead directly to a registered apprenticeship training program before the end of the grant period. 
Um, it's also very important to note that the pre-apprenticeship programs uh, will be subject to WIOA participant eligibility, case management, and performance requirements. Next Correct. Slide. And Kim, I would ask um, also um, that um, in particular, pre-apprenticeship programs tend to be a little more expensive. Um, so you'll need to um, identify um, what the costs in, uh, are on that, why the costs are higher. Perhaps you're focusing on a targeted population, um, which could create a higher cost on that. Um, so all of those items need to be um, uh, identified um, when you're um, working through. Um, but the most important thing with the pre-apprenticeship programs is um, that you are not submitting an application only for pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, the, the deliverable for all of these grants is to um, get people into a registered apprenticeship. So if you're gonna say that you're going to serve 10 um, folks through a pre-apprenticeship program, the, the end goal before the conclusion of that grant uh, term dates is that they will be in actual registered apprenticeship programs. Um, so, and that has to be spelled out in your grant application. Sorry. Thank you, Patrick. Next slide. This slide here just is kind of outlining some of the FAQs um, that either we've just addressed with you or some that may be in the uh, that we've been asked in the past. Um, all FAQs will be added uh, to the NOFO uh, landing page. So please reference that uh, frequently and make sure that you check it before submitting your um, a question that you might have because we might've already answered that question. Next slide. Any questions regarding this NOFO must be submitted in writing to apprenticeship at IllinoisWorkNet.com. It will be monitored daily and updated um, with responses. Next slide. And to assist you with your NOFO application, here are some additional apprenticeship tools and resources um, that you could use um, when developing your NOFO. These resources are also on your, uh, the NOFO landing page. We'll now open it up for um, any comments um, or questions regarding uh, the 2021 NOFO. Well, I believe Patrick, and correct me if I'm wrong, all their questions should just be posted to the FAQ, correct? That is correct, but yeah. if they have any in the chat section, we can answer them during this call. Yeah. Okay. Um, we do have a couple. Does Illinois have an apprenticeship program for cosmetology? They said they looked up apprenticeship in this occupation and Illinois is not listed as a state that allows apprenticeships for completing a cosmetology license. So let me, let me touch on that um, just a little bit. Um, you need to um, think of the type of occupation and just because it is not a registered apprenticeship and that is a nationally registered apprenticeship um, program. Um, just because there is not a registered apprenticeship listed for Illinois, um, you know, does not mean that it cannot be registered. Um, so you'll have to look into um, uh, working with uh, the Department of Labor Apprenticeship Office and um, and specifically your navigators and your intermediaries that are currently uh, listed um, on Illinois WorkNet and work with them to find out whether um, a, a particular um, sector industry or occupation type can be um, become a registered apprenticeship program. Uh, 
Okay. Um, their follow-up to this is, or perhaps the student would be in cosmetology school training, RTI, while simultaneously doing OJT hours for an apprenticeship, just trying to figure out how it would work and not violate any licensing since Illinois was not listed on that. So you kind of touched on, on what they would like, what they would need to do already, Patrick. Right. And what I wouldn't want to do on this is tell someone how they should structure their grant application. Absolutely. Um, and we didn't have any other questions or comments that have come through. Um, but if you do think of any, feel free to go to the NOFO website and um, reach out on that FAQ and those will be addressed. Are there any final remarks before we close out for today? Um, I don't think so, except to say thank you uh, for participating in the bidders uh, information uh, webinar, and um, we wish you all the best of luck in your application. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your Wednesday.